Good morning again for uh, another history lecture that I'm recording in my pajamas in my bathroom. Uh, but this will keep us on track to where we need to be when I see you all tomorrow and Friday. So where we last left off, the United States was um, very surprised by what's known as the Tet Offensive, the the coordinated attacks on South Vietnam and military, important military bases and important cities in South Vietnam by the North Vietnamese Army and the Viet Cong. Um, as we said uh, in the last lecture, Tet was a military defeat for those communist forces, but it did sway American public opinion in the sense that um, the president, based on the the reports he was receiving from his military, was telling the American people that the war in Vietnam was going well and that the light was at the end of the tunnel and that it would soon be victory. And the Tet Offensive showed that that victory was not as soon um, in the future as as the president thought or, or certainly the American people. So in the aftermath of the Tet Offensive, in February of 1968, General William Westmoreland, uh, who you see here with President Johnson, uh, called for an increase of military presence in Vietnam, and this would continue escalations that have happened in Vietnam since 1964, um, really since Johnson had taken office. An additional 200,000 troops were called for by Westmoreland, um, and President Johnson saw that increasing the troops at this point in the aftermath of Tet would increase opposition to the war in the United States um, and damage his chances at any kind of re-election in the November elections of 1968. So Johnson ultimately denies that increase. Um, a, a very small um, number of troops um, are allowed to uh, go into Vietnam following um, the Tet, but not nearly the 200,000 that Westmoreland had called for. Uh, and he begins to push the government of South Vietnam uh, for for improved political performance um, and more effective actions from the ARVN, the Army of the Republic of Vietnam, South Vietnam's army, uh, to contribute to the war effort. Johnson will, um, in March of 1968, announce that he will decline his party's nomination um, as he needs, as he says, to focus on the duties of the presidency rather than engage in partisan politics. It is, however, pretty much universally accepted uh, that the Vietnam War um, is ultimately what drove President Johnson to not search for a re-election. In Johnson's final year of office, there will be the beginning of, of negotiations uh, with North Vietnam. Um, however, they're not going to go very far. This is, of course, the United States attempting to de-escalate their involvement. Um, and North Vietnam, for their part, wants to end the bombing um, after and also after the losses during the Tet Offensive, um, they, they desire an end to the conflict. It's actually going to be South Vietnam's government that's going to be most apprehensive towards these no negotiations because they, of course, know that negotiations could ultimately lead to an American withdrawal and the government of South Vietnam has only existed throughout its entire history because of the support of the government of the United States. So if they lose that support, if the United States withdraws, they see their government collapsing, they see the North taking over. So the South Vietnamese government is going to be the hardest part to bring along in any type of negotiations. Um, it's agreed uh, in May of 1968 that Paris would be the site of these negotiations. We remember Paris is, is often the site of important negotiations. Um, and these will begin in May 13th, 1968, what are known as the Paris Peace Talks. Uh, not to be confused with what we're going to call the Paris Peace Conference from uh, 1919 following the First World War. Now, the United States was initially unwilling to make any compromises to the North, um, and this basically hedged on North Vietnam wanting to halt the bombing of, of their country, Operation uh, Rolling Thunder. North Vietnam wanted to halt the bombing before any negotiations would proceed, um, and the United States was unwilling to compromise on this. They thought that would weaken their hand. And in fact, the United States would initially respond with increased air operations in 1968. Uh, we saw the communist forces as weaker in the aftermath of the Tet Offensive and um, to, to immediately stop the bombing of, of the North would weaken our position. President Johnson, however, will call for an end to the, uh, the bombing raids of Operation Rolling Thunder in November of 1968. 
Negotiations, however, don't press forward uh, too far during, during this time. There is, of course, an election in 1968. Um, Johnson is declining to run, as I've already mentioned. Um, Republican Richard Nixon will um, be running for election. We remember him. He was uh, President Eisenhower's vice president during the 1950s. Um, and Richard Nixon supported the war effort and supported um, American success in the war effort. And he's going to run against um, President Johnson's vice president, Hubert Humphrey. Uh, Nixon has a, has a pretty wide margin um, in this election up until President Humphrey breaks with President, or Vice President Humphrey, pardon me, breaks with President Johnson's policy and he called for the cessation of bombing of, of the North. Um, and that, that ultimately brought the election a little bit closer, but Nixon wins in the end. Nixon makes a pledge to end the war in Vietnam if he's elected, and, and elected he is. So with Johnson out of office uh, by January of 1969, uh, Nixon is elected and negotiations with the North Vietnamese will restart. Now, with Nixon as a president, um, he, he certainly wants to follow through on his campaign promise of ending the war, but he needs to maintain what he considers American credibility in other foreign policy issues. So Nixon will adopt a policy known as peace with honor. Um, Peace with honor basically meaning that, that a quick withdrawal of American forces and the fall of Saigon would lead to other foreign policy failures around the globe for the United States. So the United States withdrawal would need to be a withdrawal without defeat and with the preservation of an independent, non-communist South Vietnam. Uh, the man to Nixon's left that you see here is uh, Henry Kissinger, Richard Nixon's Secretary of State, who's going to be extremely influential in shaping Richard Nixon's foreign policy goals, and um, both in, with dealing with Vietnam and then, as we'll talk about later in our year, with uh, the Chinese as well. Uh, President Nixon will adopt his own doctrine, which is known as the Nixon Doctrine, um, that basically states that nations themselves are ultimately responsible for their own defense. Uh, and this is quite a turn from, from earlier presidential proclamations like, like the Truman Doctrine or the Eisenhower Doctrine that we've already talked about. Richard Nixon would say, quote, If domination by the aggressor can destroy the freedom of a nation, too much dependence on a protector can eventually erode its dignity. And so this became the, the shaping um, notion of, of the Nixon Doctrine, that it was going to be Vietnam, South Vietnam's responsibility ultimately to defend themselves, to take care of, of their own internal issues and external issues. But the initial goal of, of keeping a military victory or gaining a military victory is still there. Uh, Richard Nixon will remove earlier restrictions put on U.S. troops in order to get North Vietnam to make concessions. Um, and covert bombing runs would also be uh, run across Cambodia and Laos um, to, to attack um, the Ho Chi Minh Trail and, and surrounding areas. Uh, this was all initially kept secret, but in 1971, uh, with the release of a series of documents known as the Pentagon Papers, which were Department of Defense reports on American involvement in Vietnam that were, were leaked to the New York Times in 1971, they outlined American bombing operations. Um, this um, would come to light. Um, actually, um, more uh, documents would become de declassified in 2000, and it was learned that bombing runs over Cambodia had actually dated back to 1965, and that Nixon's bombing was a continuation, um, an escalation of, but a continuation of, of those efforts. So negotiations to this point were still at a stalemate, and President Nixon will adopt a policy of Vietnamization. Here you can see um, the extent of the bombing over um, both North Vietnam and South Vietnam, but also including the, the border nations of Laos and Cambodia, um, especially in the regions where the Ho Chi Minh Trail would have stretched from North uh, Vietnam into the South. So Vietnamization. Vietnamization is, is one of the most important aspects to uh, Nixon's policy of, of gaining peace with honor. Um, it's essentially turning over the primary responsibility of conducting the war to the South Vietnamese government. Uh, this would allow the United States to draw down their forces while maintaining the security of the South Vietnamese government. Phased withdrawals of American troops would begin in June of 1969. 
Um, and just a, a brief clarification from, from the last lecture, the Tet Offensive uh, did not result in a, um, an immediate withdrawal of American forces. It just really resulted in the end of the dramatic escalation of American forces. So the beginning of the withdrawal of American troops comes the following year in June of 1969. Uh, some in the military and some in South Vietnam considered this um, process of Vietnamization the beginning of a, a U.S. exit, um, and, and some even go so far as to consider it a U.S. surrender in Vietnam. The number of American troops in Vietnam would be cut in half within two years, but military pressures were kept high on the North through um, escalated bombing. Anti-war sentiments at home still plagued uh, the administration um, with, with anti-war protests calling for an immediate withdrawal of U.S. forces from Vietnam. However, Richard Nixon would uh, dismiss these protests as being part of a, uh, of a vocal minority while a, a silent majority, um, he argued, still was in support of American policies. The United States would press forward um, with the peace talks that had begun years before in Paris, um, and, and ultimately the Paris peace talks um, restart in May 1972, uh, with Henry Kissinger negotiating with the North Vietnamese, who also wanted peace with honor. They, they wanted um, to end the war, but on, on their own terms. Neither side is still willing to compromise. Uh, the North is demanding representation in the government of the South, and we can see why that would be uh, distasteful for the government of the South and the United States. That's exactly what we did not want when we, um, when we refused uh, or did not allow the elections following the Geneva Accords to take place. Um, the battlefield was still active on each side, as each side is trying to gain an upper hand in the, in the fighting on the ground in order to have a better hand in enforcing concessions on their opponent. The United States, um, for their part, would respond by launching Operation Linebacker um, from May to October of 1972, which would be the first continuous bombing effort of North Vietnam since the end of Operation Rolling Thunder in November of 1968. Uh, so this was a massive bombing campaign uh, initiated by the United States to force the North Vietnamese hand. The United States also was using their detente. We haven't talked about this yet. Um, the detente period of the Cold War is an easing of tensions um, in the 1972. So we, we attempted to use our detente with the Soviet Union and China in hoping to persuade uh, the Chinese and Soviets to push the North Vietnamese to agree to a peace settlement. Uh, and ultimately, they, they would do just that. Um, the expectations of an agreement would help Richard Nixon win another presidential election in November of 1972. Um, Henry Kissinger actually would announce in late October of 1960, or pardon me, late October of 1972, um, that peace is at hand in Vietnam, um, that there was an agreement on the table. However, peace was not at hand as the South Vietnamese had refused to sign the documents that had been agreed to between the United States and the North, Vietnam North Vietnamese. In order to bring the South Vietnamese government along, and remember the South Vietnamese government is so apprehensive because in their eyes, an end to the war, a negotiated end to the war in a, in a, in a removal of American involvement meant their demise in their eyes. So the United States wanted to convince the South Vietnamese that we were going to stand behind them. So in order to force the issue and get the Paris peace talks uh, ultimately agreed to and signed, the United States issued Linebacker II, um, the, a second round of bombings over North Vietnam, uh, which are known also as the Christmas bombings of December 1972. So the United States um, issues linebacker two, um, and we are now bombing sites in Hanoi, which had previously been annoyed, uh, avoided, pardon me, um, uh, to persuade the South Vietnamese government to sign the agreement. This would actually be the largest heavy bomber campaign of the entire war. The United States assured the South that they would respond with military force if the North violated the agreement. And the settlement was ultimately reached and signed on January 27, 1973, uh, known as the Paris Peace Accords. The Paris Peace Accords, which would end, of course, American involvement in Vietnam, called for the removal of all American troops um, from Vietnam 
and both North and South Vietnam would agree to respect the dividing line between the two nations at the 17th parallel. The Paris Peace Accords also called for the release of American POWs, prisoners of war. Uh, recall we talked about um, the, the hundreds of American planes that were shot down over North Vietnam. Uh, many of those pilots were prisoners of war and we called for their release. Um, following the signing of the Paris Peace Accords, the last American troops would withdraw two weeks after signing the agreement. Uh, the South Vietnamese government, for their part, was not happy with this. Um, they, they really only were brought along and signed the, the agreement because Nixon pr uh, promised to do it without them if, um, or pardon me, threatened to do it without them if they would not sign it. Uh, so South Vietnam is reluctantly dragged along. North Vietnam, the United States, and South Vietnam signed the Paris Peace Accords in January of 1973, thus ending American involvement in the Vietnam War, but not ending the Vietnam War. In the aftermath of, of the Paris Peace Accords, North Vietnam will send 300,000 troops across that 17th parallel, obviously in violation of, of the Paris Peace Accords. Now, we recall that the United States said that we would support South Vietnam um, if there was any North Vietnamese aggression, um, but this will never come to fruition as um, the United States was going through its own domestic issues. Um, President Nixon was ousted from, uh, or pardon me, resigned from his office um, following the Watergate scandal, which we can talk more about in class. Um, his vice president, Gerald Ford, who took office, um, who, interestingly enough, because of the Watergate scandal, was never elected to any executive office. He was not elected vice president, nor was obviously he elected uh, president after uh, President Nixon resigned. Um, Gerald Ford is a president of the United States with absolutely no political capital whatsoever. Um, he, he attempts to get Congress to approve emergency military assistance for South Vietnam. Congress, obviously, for obvious reasons, will avoid that. They, uh, uh, Congress had taken a lot of the blame for the 1964 Gulf of Tonkin resolution, and they're not going to go there again. Um, so no American support will come for the South Vietnamese and Saigon will fall, the capital of South Vietnam, Saigon will fall in April of 1975. And here you see pictured um, a famous and dramatic picture of American ambassadors um, and, and diplomats and staffers leaving the, or fleeing, I guess would be a better word, the Saigon Embassy in April of 1975 by helicopter. Uh, following the fall of Saigon and the fall of South Vietnam, Cambodia and Laos would also fall to communism. But the, the dominoes uh, would stop there. Um, there would not be um, more nations in Southeast Asia or South Asia um, that would, would fall to communism following the end of the Vietnam War. The ultimate costs of the war, um, over a million mil communist military deaths from 1954 to 1975. Um, Estimates of, of possibly two million civilian casualties, but there are there are variances in 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 those numbers. Uh, South Vietnamese military deaths over 110,000 people, um, over 400,000 civilian deaths in the South, and the United States with almost 60,000 military dead. The impact on the United States at home um, it's going to have a dramatic impact on on the way the United States uh, populace views their their government, views their, their president, views the information that their, their government is, is giving them. Uh, there's going to be um, little, little to no fanfare for American troops as they return to the United States, um, dramatically different from what, what was seen at the end of, of World War II. There is a question of what the United States should do with uh, those individuals that dodged the draft, um, you know, avoided their, their draft uh, enlistment responsibilities, uh, many of which fled to Canada to avoid legal persecution. Um, some called for a blanket amnesty for, for these individuals that, that fled the draft, um, especially in light of the fact that Gerald Ford pardoned Richard Nixon for any wrongdoing in the, uh, the Watergate scandal. Um, many called for Gerald Ford to do the same for uh, any draft dodgers from the Vietnam War. Um, Gerald Ford allowed for what he called an earned amnesty, um, where, where those that had fled the United States could basically work back um, to, to, to get in the good graces of the country and regain their, their citizenship, um, though few took that opportunity. Uh, the next president, 
Jimmy Carter, who's elected in November of 1976, will eventually offer a blanket pardon to all draft dodgers um, from the Vietnam era. The impact on the Vietnam on Vietnam is, is even more dramatic. Um, integration of North and South Vietnam became very difficult. Uh, cities were flooded with refugees, uh, as much of the arable land in South Vietnam and North Vietnam was destroyed. Uh, there was, however, no bloodbath, as some had predicted. Um, with, with the fall of South Vietnam, that, that never came. That would be a story um, next door to Vietnam in Cambodia, um, when Cambodia was taken over by the communist Khmer Rouge regime. Uh, thousands in South Vietnam would endure re-education camps, um, forced collectivization of the South, uh, which is what obviously we see whenever any country comes into communism, forced collectivization of the South, um, and high military spending um, due to the Vietnam War and conflicts after uh, would make Vietnam one of the world's poorest nations. However, some more recent economic reforms have, have helped the nation out. So there is the end of the Vietnam conflict. Um, I, I hope these uh, lectures, uh, while they don't replace what we do in the class, um, make uh, it's, it's the best we could do with, with what we've been given from the weather here. Uh, we'll be in class tomorrow and Friday, and we'll talk about the things that were presented on these lectures. We'll talk about a couple of the documents that you were to read in, in the readings. And um, I'll be able to handle any, any questions you have. We'll also discuss uh, the historiography of American involvement in, in the Vietnam War and uh, the historiography of the war in general. So thanks for listening. Uh, again, try to stay warm. Um, anything you can do to, to be on top of things for, for tomorrow would be great. Make sure you've got those essays written so I can get those graded over the weekend. Take care and see you tomorrow.